Good morning, guten tag, bonjour, buongiorno. Um, it's very, uh, very nice to be here and uh, thanks uh, Candid and the other organizers for having me. Um, it's a great uh, opportunity to talk uh, about, I think, a very interesting subject uh, because we live, I think we live in interesting times. There's this uh, famous Chinese proverb uh, which says, uh, may we live in interesting times. And I think we live in very interesting times. And attribution is, I think, one of the most interesting parts um, of the work that we do nowadays. Because you see that uh, cyber attacks, there's more and more cyber attacks, destructive attacks. There was, let's say, a significant change in the way the uh, attacks are launched. Uh, when, let's say, we have started seeing destructive attacks. And with that in mind, um, probably um, you know some of the research uh, that we have done with uh, the Global Research and Analysis team at Kaspersky Lab. Um, to be honest, I started uh, looking into APTs around 2010. And um, back then, I was not really interested in this subject. Um, I was more interested in banking attacks, uh, uh, you know, exploit kits and so on. But one of my colleagues, uh, Alex Gostev, he was supposed to speak at a conference uh, in Canada. He couldn't get a visa. So he asked me, can you go instead and talk about Stuxnet? And I kind of knew what was Stuxnet. Um, I knew it was like a malicious program used in Iran. Probably it has some relations to United States and Israel. So I was not very comfortable. So I went to um, Canada to talk about Stuxnet instead of Alex. So as I got on the stage, uh, as I was talking, I saw like three people at the back of the room who were not very happy with my speech. <laughs> and um, I could feel there was some tension in the air. About two weeks after the speech, I found a gift in my home, which said, take a break. Uh, so then I realized that, uh, you know, the research that we do can have like some serious implications. And to be honest, one of the most, let's say, interesting things here is the problem of uh, attribution of cyber attacks. And I'll give you an example. Um, the USA elections from 2016, and uh, I tried very hard to find a photo of these two guys where they look nice. <laughs> because in most of the other photos, it's either one of them who looks terrible and the other nice or the other way around. Um, but maybe not many people remember that before the uh, USA elections, there was this guy called Kuchifer. And this is a photo when he was arrested by the Romanian police. And Guccifer, I think he became famous for all sorts of things. One of them being for claiming that he was able to hack into Hillary Clinton's uh, email server. So actually, at that point, he said, yeah, yeah, like, I know a lot of people who were able to hack uh, her email server and read her emails. And I think this is uh, probably an interesting story because uh, Guccifer, um, by his name, uh, Marcel uh, um, Lazar Lehel, he was a Romanian guy. His main occupation was actually a taxi driver. Um, but what is interesting that, let's say he had like a very strange, um, how to put it, mentality. Some people would say that he was a bit crazy because he said that he combines the style of Gucci with the power of Lucifer, whatever that means. <laughs> and. He had like no skills, to be honest, except the knowledge that he was able to uh, learn online. So some might actually say that he was a script kiddie, in a way. Uh, however, with his uh, script kiddie tool, uh, skills, he was able to um, do, let's say, a lot of uh, hacks, such as, for instance, he was able to hack the email of Colin Powell, the Rockefeller family. He was able to hack a bunch of FBI and uh, US Secret Service agents, um, as well as, let's say, um, a few other guys, such as Corina Carezzo and George Meyer. Now, to be honest, for the Romanian police, this was not a high-profile case until the moment that he was able to hack these two guys. Corina Crezzo was a Romanian politician, but George, uh, George, George Maior was actually the head of the Romanian intelligence service. <laughs> so, obviously, I think things changed when, uh, when he did this. 
Uh, it's funny how he managed to hack the email of uh, Corina Kretsu. Um, he actually went to her Yahoo account and he tried to reset password and he was asked, uh, I think one of the questions was her birthday. He was able to get it from some public documents. The other question that he got was the name of the street where she grew up. So she actually, he actually knew that she grew up in a city in Bucharest called Braila. So he tried the names of all the streets in Braila <laughs> until he got it right. Which uh, I would say was um, very uh, thorough from his side. However, the problem is when he hacked into George Meyer's uh, emails, he actually tried to ransom him. He blackmailed uh, George Meyer, he called him a skunk, and he asked for money not to publish his emails. And remember, this was the head of the Romanian intelligence service. So what happens is two weeks later, he got arrested. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> yeah, this was in uh, August of 2013. So then, of course, we have this uh, very interesting case uh, of the DNC hack, which is still being discussed. And it was a very interesting blog post which CrowdStrike uh, published. And in this blog post, um, he, they uh, detailed their analysis of the DNC hack. And they said they found uh, basically two hacking groups in there, one of them APT28, also known as uh, Sophocy and Fancy Bear. The other one, uh, basically the Dukes, uh, APT29. And they said, like, these two uh, APT groups, which are linked to Russia, were able to penetrate the DNC network and steal the information. So what happened next, uh, Guccifer 2.0 appeared. And Guccifer 2.0, basically, he said, you know, all this cross-strike uh, thing is bullshit. In reality, it was just me, a lone hacker, and I hacked the DNC, and the, as a proof, here's my emails. So, of course, uh, this, uh, in the beginning at least, it kind of ruined uh, uh, and, uh, let's say, put a shadow on the CrowdStrike blog, which, in my opinion, was all correct. However, some people actually had the idea of talking to Guccifer and uh, 2.0, and he was uh, quite keen to talk to them. So, for instance, uh, uh, Lorenzo Franceschi Bicchierai from Motherboard, he did an interview with Guccifer, and he asked him, where are you from? And Guccifer 2.0, he said, I'm from Romania. And then I think Lorenzo used the Google Translate to try to talk to him to see if he knows. And he says, okay, do you want to talk a bit in Romanian? To which uh, Guccifer replies also in Romanian, like, do you speak Romanian? Vorbiți românește. And then uh, Francesco asks him, uh, why did you put Russian metadata in the documents? To which Guccifer too says, it's my watermark. And he uses a very strange word here three times, uh, which is uh, filigrane. Now this word uh, in Romanian, it's extremely, extremely rare. I think there's people, that I have friends who never used this word in their life. Uh, normal people don't use this word because let's say everybody says watermarks, nobody says uh, filigrane. So actually, Guccifer too made uh, a bunch of mistakes for instance, he didn't correctly uh, say vorbitia uh, limba romana. So he made, let's say, some kind of uh, strange mistakes in his Romanian. In my opinion, he was definitely not Romanian. And some people said, okay, but uh, why is he using these words? So actually, if you go to Google Translate and you try to do, it is uh, my watermark in Romanian, you get exactly this uh, strange Romanian word, it is the filigranul mel, which as I said, nobody uses. So this kind of exposed him as, um, let's say, not being a true Romanian. So he was, let's say, trying to do a false flag uh, in this case. And I, then I realized when this story was happening that uh, even with malware, when people write malware and they try to make it look as something else, you can still catch them by mistakes because everybody makes mistakes. And when you make mistakes, they remain on the internet forever. And that's when people like us, we can actually catch them. So, this led me to think about uh, code similarity, and this is like the main topic of what I want to uh, say today, is using code similarity in big stories. And I remember uh, on 12th of May 2017, it was a Friday. How many people remember May 12th, 2017? A few people. <laughs> I know where you guys were. 
Um, it was a quiet Friday. So I was at work every, you know, Friday. Friday is the beginning of the weekend. You don't want problems on a Friday. And then a guy, like from my team from Spain, he writes me a message. You know, in Spain it's siesta, like, you know. <laughs> and he says, like, we have uh, some huge attack in Spain. Uh, there's like uh, everywhere telecommunications are down. And I'm, come on, it's siesta. And second, it's Friday. <laughs> and then, you know, we started seeing things like uh, this one and things like this one in Spain, of course, a big tragedy. <laughs> in the hotels, uh, ATMs in Russia, banking in Russia, for instance. Uh, we have uh, the uh, uh, transportation, the trams in uh, Frankfurt, uh, ATMs in China, and you all recognize this red screen. Um, and it goes on and on and on. And that was probably quite big in my opinion, <laughs> which led other people to, to uh, you know, make fun of it in a way that uh, it can hit other things as well, Nokia, <laughs> microwave ovens, washing machines, Google glasses, air conditioning, smart watches. <laughs> You know, good stuff, by the way. <laughs> Smart cars, and pretty much everywhere in the <laughs> matrix. But, of course, when the WannaCry hit, um, I worked throughout the weekend trying to, you know, take it apart. It, it was, like, uh, reasonably large, so it requires some uh, analysis. But, like, the big question everybody asked is, who is behind WannaCry? And uh, it wasn't, I think, until Monday evening when uh, Neil Mehta from Google published this cryptical message on Twitter. And when we saw the message, you know, everybody was like facepalm, of course. And the other people were like, what the hell? <laughs> but if you actually look in the, uh, in the message, what he does uh, here, he posts two hashes of two different samples, as well as uh, the offsets in these two different samples. And as I open the two samples, uh, we have them here, one and the other one. Actually, one of them is a sample of WannaCry 1.0. The other one is a sample of a worm used by the Lazarus uh, APT group. So he was the first person to point out there's a similarity between WannaCry and this uh, Lazarus group, which became famous for hacking into Sony pictures, you know, the dark civil attacks, uh, the Bangladesh uh, bank heist, and so on and so on. So an APT group. It was a pretty interesting case when a nation state or an actor suspected of being connected to a nation state to launch a ransomware attack, you know, to make money. But I guess uh, in their case, you know, it's a pretty tough situation and they needed the money. And of course, the question everybody asked was, how was Google able to do this? Because we looked, everybody, like all the people here in the room who work for antivirus companies, they all looked at the malware as well, but they couldn't find that particular fragment, which was uh, between the two samples. And going back to 2011, Google uh, bought uh, Zynamics. I think Halvar Flake was a keynote speaker here last year. Um, then in 2014, I was talking to a friend of mine who worked at Google, and we were uh, like thinking, how can we find uh, more samples of uh, this malware, whatever. And he said, you know, it's easy. You just uh, spin 10,000 machines and you do a grep in parallel. <laughs> so I was thinking like at the idea of, you know, to power up 10,000 machines and do a grep in parallel. I went to our CTO, my boss, and I said, boss. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can I get some money to buy 10,000 machines? And you can imagine his answer. And well, I said, sure. And in 2017, like a step uh, fast forward, Google links WannaCry to uh, Lazarus. So I said, we need to find some solution which allows us to do the same, but with uh, less money. And like, by the way, if you look around at uh, other companies, Google is not the only one with such capabilities. Uh, Binarly was another company. They were purchased by CrowdStrike, which uh, they developed this kind of technology. 
Uh, another one is um, in Tezer, is an Israeli company. They have a very, very good technology. I think it's uh, now it's free, so you can sign up on their website for an account and uh, play with it and see how it works. But actually, in, in let's say at least in principle, this is quite easy. For instance, you could uh, generate all the let's say between eight and sixteen by substrings of a sample, and then you search it throughout your malware collection. The, the only problem is that. At least for us, the collection is very big. We, our malware collection is now about five petabytes. So to search five petabytes of data for, uh, I don't know, a hundred thousand strings, it will take some time. So you cannot do it over the weekend or, you know, in a few hours. Uh, and we cannot buy 10,000 machines, uh, you know, to spin them whenever we need. So one of the ideas which, uh, actually I want to, um, talk about, and this is what we have done, and this is the, the nice part about this, is that anyone can do it. Like, this is a great thing about uh, Yara. How many people are familiar with Yara? Okay, um, people ask me, like a lot of young people ask me and say, uh, what is the best programming language uh, that uh, I should learn, you know, in order to become a, a researcher or something? And they say, should, is it like Python or Perl? And usually I tell them, you know, try to learn Yara, because uh, it's maybe not necessarily a programming language, but it's a very, very powerful and interesting tool which can really help your career. So with Yara, for instance, uh, the idea would be the following. First, we try to identify some relevant strings in a file, and then we make a Yara rule from it, and we just run that Yara rule on our malware collection. Now, the only problem is that how do we identify the relevant fragments of code? And for instance, if you have a 100k file, as I said, that's like uh, 100,000 substrings between, let's say, uh, just 16 bytes uh, substrings inside the sample. So even if you filter out the clean strings, what's clean? There's like strings which appear in library files, you know, like a libc style of, uh, of strings. You still have a lot, 30,000 uh, substrings. You cannot search for 30,000 substrings. But however, this can actually be optimized a bit. So if you look at these two different uh, strings here, the one on top, which is a prolog of a function compiled by Visual C, and the other one is full of uh, CCs. By the way, anybody knows what is CC, which instruction? No? Usually um, there's like one guy in the back yelling, it's int three. <laughs> I need to hire such a guy next time. Uh, so yeah, it's like full of in3, you know, which are kind of, let's say, uh, debug instructions put uh, in the code by a compiler to pad the code. So you don't want to make a signature on that because you'll find it in almost, uh, you know, any other uh, Windows program out there. So if you look for the interesting strings, like the one on top, for instance, you can make Yara rules like this one here. Uh, and you see like different shellcode fragments which appear uh, in the shadow pad APT samples, for instance, but they don't appear in any clean samples out there. And this is like a very powerful um, Yara rule which finds a lot of stuff. So you can actually improve it. You make the Yara rule you, on one sample, then you test it on several samples, and you only keep the fragments of code which are found across different samples uh, of the same family. And then you run the rule on something like virus total uh, malware intelligence, which allows you to do this. Um, just like some numbers about the uh, system that we have. We uh, have a system uh, that we call YANA, which processes about a quarter million samples per day this way. And it knows about 28 million good samples. We uh, actually, we keep growing this number. Um, and it has like about 4 billion known good strings and about um, 8 billion known good uh, opcode sequences. So we know that those opcode sequences only appear in clean programs. So when you have this, everything which is left is basically suspicious. So let me actually show some examples. You know, all this theory is nice, but what about some real world examples. So, for instance, uh, I was mentioning ShadowPad before. Uh, this was a very cool case. Um, a financial institution hired one of our guys to check their network. They said, we have some suspicions that there's something bad in our networks, but we cannot find it. So our guy went there 
he started looking at, he found a DN, some DNS requests to some kind of random looking domains that were originating from one of their payment servers. So like a very sensitive system which was processing financial transactions. So he looked there, he couldn't find any malware. So what he did, he dumped the memory and he found the piece of code which was making those DNS calls. It was in a software called um, NetSarang from a company called NetSarang. And this was like a legitimate software, like a management, a server management software, which appears to have been hacked by someone and injected with a malicious fragment of code about 40 kilobytes in size. So the attackers which launched this attack, I think they were pretty good. They hacked into NetSarang, they got to their build server, they got to their source code, they edited the source code uh, in a very nice way, uh, and they linked this malicious uh, program, um, uh, like uh, they modified the linker in their, uh, let's say, uh, production uh, conveyor belt to include the malicious uh, module in pretty much all their programs. So it was like a pretty cool attack. So we worked with the uh, NetSarang to, um, uh, you know, identify the problem, to mitigate it, and so on. But the question was, of course, who did it? Like, who is as good as these guys to do something like this? And we were able to find some similarities between uh, one of the Shadowpad plugins with our system and a plugin from a sample observed in a WinNTI incident. If, in case you're not familiar with it, WinNTI is a um, malware used by um, two Chinese uh, APT groups, which both have, like, let's say, different focuses. One of them is hacking uh, gaming companies and stealing, you know, uh, e-money kind of things, weapons, virtual weapons, which is pretty serious stuff. And the other guys are stealing, like, submarine uh, diagrams, torpedoes, and such, which is also very serious stuff for other people. So if you look at the code between these two plugins, by the way, it's, uh, you can see it's uh, pretty much identical, but what is it exactly? So this is what it looks if when you uh, reverse it into C. It's a uh, hashing subroutine for APIs, and it's unique to these guys. So uh, we kind of, we are confident that uh, the guys who did this NetSarang attack, they're not the one with the games. More likely, they're the ones with the submarines. Or maybe it's the games. Uh, the other big incident was a sea cleaner attack from the last year. Uh, this was pretty big as well because there are uh, tens of millions of people running sea cleaner and overnight sea cleaner came uh, with the malware inside in the same style that NetSarang. In the beginning, let's say we couldn't uh, find any connections, but later we realized there was the same group behind the two. And we immediately like checked it with our similarity system and we found that there's a fragment of code between uh, the backdoor used in the CCleaner incident and the uh, APT17 backdoor called Missile. So I put it on Twitter. Um, there's like similarity with that and immediately the guys from Intezer that I mentioned below, they confirmed that their system also thinks the same. And by the way, if uh, you run the Yara rule that we built from that, it finds a bunch of different malware from these uh, APT17 guys. So, Missile, Gressim, and Hikit. And, uh, speaking of that, by the way, what is this uh, Missile uh, thingy? It's funny that they're calling the malware Missile. Uh, there's a very cool presentation from a guy called Chris McConkey that you can find on YouTube. He was able to find the guy behind this. Um, he was able to find the uh, exact guy who wrote the missile malware and his accounts on uh, 163, the QQ account, and so on. Um, and apparently this is a malware developer which created Hikit, Missile, and Gressim, so all three. So he has probably access to the source code which uh, does this. And the Noveta report, is a um, report published by a company called Noveta, they pointed out that the malware, these families of malware, um, like for instance Poison, uh, Ivy and Ghost, they're used, I think, uh, by different groups. However, uh, tools like Zox PNG, Gressim and Hikit, they're only used by the Axiom APT group. And the Axiom APT group is one of the groups which use the WinNTI malware in their attacks to steal the submarine uh, 
uh, blueprints, not the games, basically. So we kind of know now that it was those guys. Um, by the way, this process of digging back, I'm calling it sometimes cyber paleontology, because you take something and you look for dinosaurs, you know, 10 years ago or more. Um, here's another example of a uh, uh, rule created by our system for Regin. Uh, in case you're not familiar with Regin, there's a very good uh, paper from Symantec about Regin. They were the first to publish it, and we also published once uh, a few days later. Um, this is one of the most sophisticated APTs we have seen, which targeted uh, GSM operators, telecommunication companies, and so on. And they had the ability to uh, mess with the base stations in GSM networks in order to intercept uh, calls or to uh, launch uh, destructive attacks if they wanted, let's say. So when we run this uh, Yara rule on our malware collection, one of the first hits we had was on a Shadow Brokers uh, DLL um, called CNLI.DLL. So we immediately, if you look there, and you see there's like a lot of code overlap. So we look there and we see that this CNLI-1, uh, it actually has a bunch of um, exports. Um, such as CNE file IO, CNE file IO dear next, and so on. So pretty much all um, file system uh, functions that you can imagine, they're implemented by this DLL. Uh, by the way, any idea what is CNE? Um, well, I think there's different explanations. One of them could be it's a computer network exploitation. So like in this terminology used by um, spy agency, there's computer network exploitation and there's computer network attack, which is their words for espionage and sabotage. So CNE is another way of saying uh, exploitation of networks, uh, espionage basically. So it's a library, pretty much a library, which is matched by got this uh, code signature from the shadow broker's dump and nothing else. So if you look inside, actually what is the code doing? Uh, well, this particular fragment of code is a wrapper for the uh, pretty much, let's say, standard uh, uh, I.O. functions in the operating system, such as write file, for instance, you see it here uh, in a regin sample in the CNLI-1 uh, DLL. So why do you need such a library to make your code portable on any operating system? So this way, by implementing these uh, functions from the library, they can compile their code for pretty much any operating system where CNLI is uh, available, like uh, you know, uh, Unix system, Solaris, Linux, uh, even routers, uh, of course. Another cool case which we uh, analyzed is the case of the Lambert's APT. So this started in 2014 with a zero-day attack on a uh, um, nuclear research agency in the European Union, basically. So from there, we called the malware, we called it the Black Lambert, um, because, you know, it sounds scary. So it was like a scary attack, so like the Black Lambert. So next, we found another malware, which was maybe a bit less scary, so we called it the White Lambert, you know, just to be politically correct and uh, not have any issues. Then we had another one, we found the Blue Lambert, the Green Lambert, the Pink Lambert, <laughs> you know, we want to be like fair and square. And the gray Lambert and the brown Lambert, the red Lambert, the gold Lambert, is like a, kind of a never-ending story with the, with the Lamberts. <laughs> and uh, we published about this, uh, Symantec again published about their own analysis. I think Symantec um, uh, were the first and a few days later we also published our own analysis. And uh, if you look at the timeline of discoveries, we found, uh, we started looking into the Black Lambert in 2014 and it took like uh, about three years of research to uh, find the Brown Lambert in October 2017. Um, so Maybe some will say it's, you know, it's kind of crazy to waste three years of your life chasing colors, you know, malware colors. <laughs> but it's one of the things I think which makes this job interesting because uh, you work with very cool things and this is why I really like my job because we always have to do interesting things. Uh, by the way, the Lamberts also had malware for OS X, so for Mac, and we suspect they also had malware for Unix systems. And they were active probably uh, since 2009 or before. So we 
put our code similarity system just in case to see how it works uh, through these different uh, Lambert samples and we immediately it found a shared code fragment uh, which appears in the white Lambert, the black Lambert and brown Lambert. So, you know, this, this took like a couple of minutes. So for us who like spent three years uh, looking for connections, you know, obviously we didn't spend all the three years doing only this, but things are kind of slow, you know, when you jump from one to another. You load it in IDA, you look at the code, you think what could be common code, and all of this can be now done like in a pretty much matter of minutes. Here's another example for the WannaCry thing, replicating what uh, Google did. So uh, a fragment of code from uh, WannaCry, which catches a blue Norov malware used in the Bangladesh heist, manuscript malware, which is used in uh, uh, a bunch of very cool attacks against uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, for instance, and my colleague uh, Song Su Park will talk about this tomorrow, uh, cyber attacks against uh, cryptocurrency exchanges in South Korea. Um, by the way, I hope um, everybody purchased bitcoins when they were like a, a dollar a piece, right? And sold them when they were 20,000, <laughs> right? Um, and Decafet is another keylogger used by the, by the Lazar group. And there's also like another uh, uh, code fragment extracted by our system with, uh, for instance, it catches uh, dark hotel samples. This is a pretty interesting APT that we found was targeting hotels and um, they would uh, hack into the Wi-Fi system of the hotel and the reservation system and they would have the ability to uh, see who checks in in what rooms. And only the people which were interesting for, uh, to them would get targeted. So when they connected to the Wi-Fi, they would have like a, a prompt to update your Flash player. You know how that goes. So if you download the Flash player, and you know the people who usually do stay in these hotels are not security experts. But when you see that you cannot connect to the Wi-Fi unless you have the latest Flash player, what can you do? You need to work. So you download it, of course. So I think pretty much this is how <laughs> the uh, new Yara rules look. You know, when uh, when you have the ability to do Yara rules with opcodes. So, so what does it all mean? Like, uh, you know, uh, I would uh, say this pretty much it brings us to the age of attribution 2.0. So what do we mean by attribution 2.0? Well, first of all, we can do now things which took years, we can do it in a matter of uh, minutes. And I think that, uh, as I said, Google has probably an amazing technology. Uh, Intezer has technology, CrowdStrike has it. I think pretty much everybody will have this technology in two, three years. So what it means is that now we'll be able to very quickly say when there's a cyber attack, we'll be able to say, yeah, we, we suspect with uh, some degree of confidence that it's that APT. But what does it mean also as an effect? We think they'll see more false flags. And the best examples, uh, the Lazarus group, for instance, uh, after the NSA said that the Lazarus group attacks, they think they're linked to North Korea, they started putting Russian keywords in the malware, like, but really bad Russian keywords, like nobody writes them that way. <laughs> so it didn't fool anyone, obviously, but it was like an attempt, you know, to blame Russia because nowadays it's fashionable to, um, to just blame Russia for everything, I guess. <laughs> And the other thing is uh, the Olympic destroyer case, uh, which I think is quite interesting, in which they tried to blame North Korea. Some people said, you know, it's revenge for the Russian keywords in the Lazarus Mahler. So what happened there, they tried every to fool everybody thinking into the fact that North Korea was launching these attacks on the Olympic Games. So, of course, we think that we'll ha also have more uh, shell-related attacks, PowerShell, uh, PowerShell Empire, you know, these kind of frameworks. And those are like very difficult to attribute because if all the uh, threat actors start using open source tools, you don't know who is who anymore. So I think that will be the next uh, level of challenge. And if you look, let's say, just to leave you guys with the final picture, uh, of what I think the information war looks nowadays. Well, we have on one hand, we have um, espionage and we have sabotage, which both use malware. And I think we got pretty good at catching this. Uh, we are able, we know how to do this. There's one thing which is more worrying, in my opinion. 
And that one is a mass opinion manipulation. You know, the kind of uh, fake news attacks, uh, Facebook-related uh, uh, mass uh, opinion manipulation. And for that, I don't think we have a solution. And I believe that we, as a security community, we have to do something by ourselves in order to help that. So it's uh, our duty to work in this direction. And if we don't, I'm worried about the future of uh, democracy. So with this positive thing in mind, please help us save the world. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thanks.